Hey everybody, it's Mr. Wagstaff. Cool stuff to talk about today. So today, we're gonna to be focusing on JFK's time in office. There is some pivotal events that happened in this three years he's the president, a thousand days before he is assassinated, that is really going to fundamentally change the culture in the United States, which is uh, what this unit is about. Let's go ahead and get started. So JFK, uh, you may be familiar with, familiar with those initials. John F. Kennedy is the guy here on the right. Uh, he is going to run for president in 1960. He is the, he's going to win, spoiler alert. He's going to be the youngest president that we've ever had. Um, the guy to his left, that's Lyndon B. Johnson, who is his vice president, which is very important here since JFK won't finish out his term because uh, he'll be assassinated that we'll talk about today. Uh, and Lyndon B. Johnson is a pivotal president himself uh, when he comes in. It's important to point out that JFK wasn't a wildly popular president while he was the president. However, once he is assassinated, a lot of the things that he stood for that weren't popular become popular and a lot of the American culture is going to change because of it. His impact on American culture um, is really going to start from the time he runs for president. So JFK in 1960 is going to run for president and he's going to run against uh, the vice president of the previous president, Dwight Eisenhower, a guy named Richard Nixon. Now, if Richard Nixon sounds like a name that you are familiar with, Richard Nixon will eventually, eight years later, win the presidency and will eventually become a president. But uh, so neither one of these men here have become the president before and they're both running for presidency in 1960. So they're going to have a debate. Having a debate is not uncommon. Presidents did that all the time. What is different about this debate is that JFK, all right, uh, asked to do it on TV. And Nixon's like, all right, I'll beat you anywhere. Nixon is a very good debater. He is also a very good politician. He expects to run circles around JFK. So JFK, uh, he's naturally, he always looks like a movie star. Uh, uh, so he's used to being on TV, which is, again, new for, since the 1950s. It's really just taken over. Uh, so he knows on TV you need to wear makeup to keep yourself from sweating and things like that. Uh, so when he shows up on set, he has his makeup on and stuff. Uh, Nixon's like, oh, makeup, that's, that's for girls. Uh, and Nixon also, and while we would never notice it today, back then everybody wore suits that so had to fit you right. He had just gotten over the flu and had lost about 10 pounds. So his suit looked a little big, which is not a professional look at the time. Today, we would have no idea because we don't see everybody wear suits like they used to. Uh, not only that, during the debate, he, uh, you can kind of see in this picture here, this screenshot of the debate, Nixon slouches. When JFK talks, he looks down. He's thinking. JFK stays very proper and upstanding the entire time. Um, everybody who listened to the debate on the radio said Nixon won. Everybody who watched it on TV said JFK just looked more like a president and that JFK won. More people watched it on TV than the radio and JFK is going to win this election, <clears throat> and not by a lot, uh, but he's going to win this election in large part because of his appearance and his image and, and how he projects himself. Uh, and from this point on, uh, presidential elections uh, and debates are always done on TV. So JFK coming in, being the, the you know young guy, uh, a lot different than, than the old you know the old dudes. Uh, he's got a beautiful wife. He has little kids. This whole time period was referred to as like the Camelot years. It just seemed awesome and new and, uh, you know, a new chapter in American society. All of that is true. And you would think he would be very popular. One of the reasons JFK is not super popular among the American public, he doesn't have a mandate, he doesn't have overwhelming public support, is because he supports civil rights. Now, we had talked about the civil rights movement yesterday and kind of hit, hit the high points. This is 1960, all right? JFK supports equal, uh, equal rights for African Americans in the United States. Shockingly, hopefully this is shocking to you, that makes him not popular. That's one of the biggest digs on him is the fact that he supported equal rights. So uh, while he is the president, the concept of equality and, and civil rights actually hurts him politically. One of the things that does not hurt him politically is his concept of flexible response. He's like, hey, 
the previous guy, uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, wanted this idea of brinkmanship, constantly going to the uh, brink of nuclear war. Let's not do that. I think the uh, you know each individual situation should have a you know a logical response to it, and we shouldn't go to nukes uh, immediately as the first round of defense. The fact that we are not trying to nuke everybody, uh, and hopefully they don't try to nuke us in, in this time period of this fear of being attacked with nukes, it, people like that, that, that this guy's not trying to start a nuclear war. This cartoon here is with JFK and uh, Nikita Khrushchev. So at this point, Stalin has died, and the guy that took over the Soviet Union is Nikita Khrushchev, that's depicted here, the bald guy, uh, and is trying to keep the uh, nuclear war gorilla in the box. So the question here is, how did the televised debate between JFK and Nixon change presidential elections forever. So pause me, answer that completely, we're moving on. So we come crazy close to annihilation uh, during JFK's time in office. Uh, there's something that happened called the Cuban Missile Crisis. It's a combination of lack of communication, and that, that, that's a big one, uh, and these like hard lines we've drawn in the uh, sand with each other, us and Russia, um, and it about becomes a cataclysmic event uh, in 1962. Uh, and I, 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 can't, I cannot overstate that. We were really close to just absolute nuclear annihilation, like within minutes of it. So let me explain to you what happens. So there is a little country uh, 90 miles off the coast of Florida called Cuba. All right, uh, this is a Spanish-American war. America goes in there, kicks out the Spanish. Cuba is allowed to be their own independent country. Um, so we don't own Cuba. They're not supposed to get crazy or anything, but we don't own them. Well, Cuba ends up getting a dictator named Fidel Castro. So I should point out that uh, Fidel Castro, uh, he came to power because we supported him coming to power, which is kind of beyond the scope of, of the survey course. Uh, but he comes into power and we're like, good, he's gotta be better than the last guy. And then uh, America doesn't wanna help him create a government. So he asks Russia for help, so he becomes communist. And then we're very angry about that. So America is very hostile uh, and upset with the fact that Cuba has become communist. That is, containment was our main goal and now 90 miles off the coast of Florida, we have a country run by this guy that is communist. So, because it's so close, we're gonna spy on it all the time, all right? Uh, we have these U-2 planes that have gotten us in trouble a, a couple points already in, in, in history, but we fly over Cuba with these U-2 planes and we spy on them and see what they're up to, all right? We fly over one day in 1962, spying on them, and realize that this dude, Fidel Castro, has allowed, at no point do we think these are actually his missiles, but we realize Fidel Castro has allowed Russia, fellow communist nation, to put Soviet nuclear missiles in Cuba. The reason that is really bad, on top of all the other reasons, is, see, today you can just hit a button and you can hit uh, anywhere on Earth with any missile launching from Nebraska. Uh, Back then, there was a very clear limit of how far that they could reach. Uh, so we didn't have to worry about Russia launching a nuke from Russia and hitting us. But having it in Cuba, they can basically wipe out anywhere in America. When we see this, JFK freaks out because uh, the high impact zone uh, of Washington, D.C. <laughs> is within striking distance here from Cuba. So you would think, obviously America is going to freak out over this. But who's the first person you think JFK would talk to? Well, the leader of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev. The problem is the Iron Curtain, all right? That figurative wall, there's no phone lines that go in or out of the Iron Curtain. There's no way to contact him. We realize they have nukes in Cuba, and they have more nukes on their way across the Atlantic Ocean, like, as soon as we, we find that out. So JFK... All right, it's, it's do or die time for, Jeff, for JFK. He has to figure out how he's going to handle this. So what he does is he goes on national TV and he basically calls out Russia and says, Russia, I see you have nukes in Cuba. Remove them immediately. We have surrounded Cuba with our Navy, the United States Navy. We know you have more nukes coming in from Russia. 
those boats better turn around and go back to Russia and take down the nukes that you have in Cuba. If you don't, when we see those boats coming into uh, Cuba from Russia that have those nukes on it, we're going to sink those boats. Now, he has to say this on national worldwide TV because this is the only way they can get a message to Russia. Because I know Russia is watching the, the TV shows, but we can't communicate with them. Uh, and this has to happen like quick because we're not going to allow this because JFK says the only reason they would do this is like a preemptive attack. All right. And this is completely unacceptable. So now it's like a waiting game to see what Russia does. All right. And those ships are still inching across the Atlantic Ocean heading to Cuba to provide more nukes. We know today, like this is not hyperbole when I say we come real close to being wiped out. So present day, with all this stuff being de declassified, our ships were giving a standing order. If you see those boats come across the Atlantic Ocean, open fire on them. Like if they come within eyesight, open fire on them. We know that. Uh, Russia had submarines off of our coast that can launch a nuke and they can basically hit anywhere. The Russian submarines were given the standing order that if America opens fire on those ships to launch nukes onto America, if those nukes get launched in America, America launches nukes on Ru and the whole world basically ends. Because we're talking hydrogen bombs here, all right? Uh, so it is a, re and those ships just are inching across the Atlantic Ocean and nobody knows what to do. So this is all top secret. We don't really know how this plays out. Uh, here's my guess. Uh, so I know what the end result is, which is accurate, but this is how I imagine it happens. Clearly, we had to find some way to communicate with Russia over what we're going to do here. I imagine that we had a spy somewhere spying on a country, and we knew Russia was also spying on that same country, and we're going to have our two spies basically talk it out. So I imagine they're like both spying on France. I don't know. Uh, and that the American spy and the Russian spy are sitting down in a little cafe with Paris and the Eiffel Towers in the background. Uh, and they basically have to you know, blow their cover and basically come up with an agreement they can take back to their countries to prevent this from happening. The conversation probably went something like this. The American spies like, Russia, you have got to remove your nukes. We, we will ab absolutely attack. And Russia's like, well, well, I don't know why you are being so crazy. We're just defending ourselves. And America's like, defending yourselves? There's, why would you put nukes right next to us in case you were trying to attack us? And Russia's like, oh, so that's the only reason you put nukes near somebody is in case you're going to attack them. And America's like, absolutely. And then Russia's like, well, then how come you got missiles in Turkey? And the American guy's like, what? See, America didn't think Russia knew that we had nuclear missiles in Turkey, which is a NATO country. We can hit Moscow from Turkey. Russia doesn't like this, all right? We thought we were being sneaky and that Russia didn't know about it. So Russia, in response to us having nukes in Turkey, puts nukes in Cuba so that they can retaliate if we launch our nukes in Turkey. So the agreement is, <laughs> okay, you got us. You got us, Russia. Tell you what, if you go back and tell Nikita Khrushchev that you will, uh, that you guys are, you know, if you go back and tell him to remove the nukes from Cuba and to turn those ships around, I'll go tell our guy to take our nukes out of Turkey. They take it back. They agree to this, all right? Now, the reason it was so close the ships turn around and they were 15 minutes from eyesight from Cuba. 15 minutes more, America opens fire on those ships, the submarines launch nukes, America launched nukes on, on Russia, and the whole world basically is annihilated. Uh, within 15 minutes, it's terrifying. But, so America, uh, we basically bow up to Russia. And now granted, it was a compromise that we pulled our nukes out of, out of Turkey. But to the world opinion, it looks like America won. Because we bowed up to Russia and said, you better back down. And then Russia, very publicly, turns their ships around, takes the nukes out of Cuba. See, the, the nukes in Turkey were secret. The whole world didn't know about those nukes. So it, didn't, it, it just looked like America bowed up to Russia and, and the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union backed down. So this very much appears to be a win for the United States. Uh, so the question here is explain what happened in Cuba and how we came within minutes of World War III with Russia because of it. So uh, I also want to point out 
there's an embargo on Cuba. After this, we're like, Cuba, not cool. Not cool for allowing that to happen. So up until uh, Barack Obama allowed a couple things to be traded, but really until the 2000s, uh, about 2012, I believe, uh, you could have zero trade at all with Cuba. Nothing, no American stuff can go in, no Cuban stuff can come to America because uh, we've been salty with uh, Cuba for a long time. So, but answer this question, pause me, answer that completely, we're moving on. So when you come within 15 minutes of world annihilation, uh, you wanna make sure that doesn't happen. So America and Russia, we try to ease some tensions afterwards. Uh, we came within 15 minutes because we couldn't communicate with each other. That was a silly problem to have. So after the Cuban Missile Crisis, there's a hotline put in. It's like a red phone that literally sits on the president's desk uh, throughout the entirety of the Cold War. And there's like a, a cord that runs like around the world. And there's a red phone on the, on the desk in the Kremlin, which is the White House in Russia, uh, so that these leaders can communicate with each other when something crazy like this uh, is, is taking place. The next thing that we do, and this is uh, credit to Russia and America for solving a problem before it really happens. It's called the Limited Test Ban Treaty. So just like how the hotline is supposed to prevent war by speeding up communication, we love testing nukes. How big can we make the bomb? Like, you know, kind of intimidate the other one. Like, look how big our bomb is. And we detonate them all the time. Uh, so when you detonate a bomb on the ground, uh, it goes way up to the sky. Well, now it's like hitting space. These bombs are so big, like hitting space, like in our test areas. And it's got like millions of pounds of radioactive material that then falls right back down to wherever the bomb was blasted at over the next few hours. Well, if a storm comes in when you detonate one, it could take that radioactive material and move it thousands of miles away. America and Russia are like, hey, I wonder if this is like the first conversation they had on the red phone. Like, hey, so I was thinking, it would be really bad if we were like testing a bomb and then like took a whole bunch of radioactive stuff and like dropped it on you on accident because like a storm did that. And then you're gonna think we did it on purpose and then we could accidentally start World War III. Um, we don't want that to happen. And Russia's like, yeah, that would, be a, that would be bad too to accidentally start World War III. So we create this thing called the Limited Test Ban Treaty. We can still test nukes, but you can't do it in the atmosphere. Meaning you can't detonate them on ground. In order to detonate them, you have to dig a huge hole under the ground and put it way in, in, in the ground and then detonate it and then use like earthquake Richter scales uh, in order to um, uh, verify how accurate it is and how effective it is. Uh, but these two things are trying to prevent an accidental war. So the question here is why is the, uh, why is the hotline and the limited test ban treaty between America and Russia effective ways at preventing an accidental war? So pause me, answer that completely. We're moving on. All right. This could be a whole course. It could be a whole lesson, uh, but we're just gonna talk about it here for a couple minutes because it's, it's all part of the Cold War and JFK is pivotal in this culture change as well. So uh, it all starts the space race, all right? 1957, America looks up into the sky and there's this blinking thing. This, and now this looks huge here. It, it's, on, it's like this big, all right? Uh, we see this blinking light go across our sky. We're like, that's not a star. It's a satellite. Russia has launched a satellite called Sputnik. And they've direct, it goes directly over America at night. And it just circles Earth. Oh, this is, it's a blinking light. That's all it does. All right. But this is crazy. Like, America can't do this. And we're like, wait, what? Like, now our I, I, thoughts go to... Can, can Russia make, make like space nukes? Like, oh my gosh, like well, we, we aren't smart enough to do this. So the launch of Sputnik in 1957 leads to an entire event. This could be a, it's, is entire courses called the space race. America and Russia now duke it out with brain power. All right, where it, it is an extension of the cold war because we want to be better at each other at everything. Not only could space possibly be the next frontier for military use, uh, that we find out it's really not very conducive for that, but we want to prove to them we have better scientists than they do. The problem is we don't. 
Russia's way advanced. So we actually have to create a, a group called NASA, all right, uh, in which we are going to start trying to go to space too. We make the, uh, JFK actually says, you know what the end result is of this whole space race is we both try to make more rockets. Who can be the first one to go to the moon? When JFK says this, we have not got a rocket off the ground yet and uh, Russia's already like launching animals <laughs> into space. They survived to get to space, they never come back. That's a whole nother thing. Uh, so in 1960, JFK says, by the end of this decade, we're gonna put a man on the moon. And everybody's like, what? Russia beats us at every single step of this process. Uh, they first man uh, put animals in space, first one to orbit Earth, put uh, first one to put put a man in space. Obviously, for satellite Sputnik, and America, we are dragging behind. And then when JFK is assassinated in 1963, we get ready to talk about it. People are like, you know what? Let's do it for JFK. And America gets like double motivation because JFK said we're going to put a man on the moon by 1969. So we go from not being able to launch a rocket to putting a man on the moon in 1969, which we do. Russia never does this. To this day, Russia has never done it. It is such an amazing thing that this, there's all these people like, oh, moon landing was staged. It's not, uh, it's, it, it's not. It's a real thing that happened. So in 1969, right, like half a, over half a century ago, we put a man in a spaceship we launch him into space, and then he gets out of his little secondary spaceship and lands on the moon, hops out, takes the American flag, like, America, gets back into his spaceship, connects back to his like mothership spaceship, flies back to Earth, and is like, been to the moon, woo, see that thing in the sky? Put a flag on it. I can't explain to you how psycho that sounds. Like, hopefully that seems ridiculous to you. We did that. And then we went back a couple more times, but then we're like, this is just really expensive and there's nothing really to do here. So we don't really do it anymore. Uh, I think China might've been to the moon, but present day, but that was only since the last 10 years or so. Uh, America uh, fundamentally uh, kind of won this space race by showing we can do something that Russia can't do. And it's kind of crazy, like the come from behind victory kind of with the space race, uh, because we were way behind Russia. And then really with the assassination of JFK, the guy who gave them that time frame by the end of the decade. So in 1969, we do put a man uh, on, on, on the moon. As crazy as that sounds. But the question here is, explain how the space race was an extension of the Cold War. So pause me, answer that completely. We're moving on. All right, so JFK is assassinated. Uh, this is something I even talk about for three seconds or the whole, you know, course or unit kind of thing. So I'm trying to do, do in the middle. There is conspiracy theories that surround JFK's assassination. All right. Uh, and the reason is, is that the assassination happened, we'll talk about it, uh, of, of what happens. Uh, what, what is verifiable for all accounts. Uh, they go investigate it, see what happens. They come up with a conclusion. It's all well and good, case closed. Then they find out later that there's a video of it and the video seems to kind of contradict what the official report says happened. And it's all kind of top secret and, and, and you'll never know because it was top secret for 50 years and once everything got unboxed, you can't really. So probably never gonna know if there is a conspiracy here, but the end of the day for history class, JFK gets assassinated. And it's a huge event in American history, all right? So JFK, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, he has gotten more popular. Still that whole civil rights thing makes him not popular, but he has gotten more popular because he seems like a strong, effective leader. So JFK, all right, uh, has beef with the governor of Texas, Governor Connolly, who's in the front passenger seat here. Not the driver, but the guy sitting next to the driver, his face is kind of blocked. All right, now, oh, Governor Connolly shot him. No, no, don't, ju don't jump ahead too much on the conspiracy theories, all right? Uh, so what happens, uh, uh, sorry, Governor Connolly's sitting directly in front of JFK. That's another Secret Service guy in the front seat. It's a, it's a limo. Three rows. Anywho, so 
Uh, JFK uh, decides he's going to build a new NASA space center down in Texas. Well, Governor Connolly likes the fact that federal money is being spent on the space station, so now he likes JFK. He says, JFK, come on down here for the grand opening of this uh, space station. So JFK comes down there, they cut the big ribbon, hooray, everything is glorious. Then they're going to go like have lunch uh, at his um, at the president's mansion. So JFK gets in this limo and they're going to drive through the Dallas streets. And back then they let everybody know the president's coming and come out. You can wave at him. It's kind of like a parade, a little faster than a parade. Uh, he's going to be in a convertible because it's people don't see the president often. Because of this, they don't do that anymore. So as JFK is going through the streets here in 1963 in this car, he gets shot by a sniper. Uh, he actually gets shot a couple times uh, with a sniper rifle, all right? Uh, and he dies. This makes Lyndon B. Johnson the president. Uh, Governor Connolly got shot too. It like went in, into him, but he, he survived. Uh, Jackie Kennedy, his, his wife next to him, freaks out. It's a whole, it's a whole thing, but she uh, uh, is not physically injured, but traumatizing. So he is shot. They arrest this guy, Lee Harvey Oswald, for shooting him. Lee Harvey Oswald 100% took a sniper rifle in a school book depository building. He's a Cuban sympathizer. He doesn't think, he doesn't like the way um, JFK deals with uh, Cuba. Wants to kill JFK. All of that is true. He is a trained sniper in the military. He had a sniper rifle. He fired shots at JFK. All of that is true. Uh, he then tries to run away. He kills a cop, like running away, and then gets uh, arrested in a movie theater. Uh, and he gets uh, arrested. When everybody finds out Lee Harvey Oswald has been arrested, the FBI, all right, uh, after seeing like the type of stuff the local police can do uh, with like the B B Bull Connor stuff uh, with the Freedom Riders, it's like, I'll let the FBI handle this. Y'all don't interrogate him and mess anything up. So nobody's even allowed to interrogate him until the next day when he is supposed to be transported from the police station to the FBI headquarters down the street once the FBI people show up. So on national TV as Lee Harvey Oswald is being, and nobody has interrogated him yet, right? This is the next day. He is being walked out by some FBI agents to be uh, put in a car and taken down the street. This dude, Jack Ruby comes out and shoots and kills Lee Harvey Oswald at point blank range. This looks like, how did they not know that? This was on TV and it happened like that. So uh, Lee Harvey Oswald dies. Jack Ruby had terminal cancer and is gonna die of natural causes a couple months later. Uh, and nobody really knows what happened here uh, because they never interrogated Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, so because this just seems kind of weird, like why would Jack Ruby do it? He doesn't even have a motive, he just does it. Uh, they go investigate it, they're like, looks like Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. Case closed. Then there's a video comes out of it called the Zapruder film. Guy videos it, doesn't realize what he has until years later. Uh, and the big thing about the video that makes everything come into question is it, has, it shows JFK getting shot. JFK's getting shot from behind. Everybody assumed JFK was turning around and looking because he got shot here. Uh, the video looks like JFK was looking, was looking forward and his head went backwards, which would be the opposite because Lee Harvey Oswald would have been behind him. And that's where all the, like, there had to be a second gun and somebody else was shooting at him. Like, and that's where the conspiracy comes from. But we'll, we will never know um, uh, what, what came of that. Uh, but when JFK gets killed, everybody loves everything about JFK. The number one way of getting positive as the president, get killed while you're the president. He is so popular as the president that uh, everything he stands for becomes accepted, including the civil rights movement. When JFK gets killed, people are like, you know what? I think we should do some more for the civil rights movement. And that's what's going to allow the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 to get passed is because that's stuff JFK wanted to do. And when he got killed, all of a sudden there's support for it because he basically died for his beliefs. It's kind of how assassinations work uh, with the presidents. So answer that completely. Uh, and I'll see you guys tomorrow.